This is the next gen G15, the G2. And this guy here is the Ghost R1. We're gonna put them together. Welcome to Machines and Warps. So hopefully you got a look at the quick preview I posted up last week and got to see what's in the box. I won't rehash those details today. Instead, I'll cover the performance of the cooler. We'll also do some comparisons and I'll discuss whether you should buy this cooler. And if so, since there are three versions, I'll uh, discuss which version to buy. So one thing special, I tested the cooler in a pre-production low-key Ghost R1. In this case, it is available to pre-order now, so go ahead and check it out. I am reviewing this case. I already started on that. The video will drop soon, so please keep an eye out for that. If you enjoy small form factor cases and cooling content, please give a like and subscribe because it really helps the channel. Also, big thanks to Noctua. They sent by the D15 G2 samples at no cost to the channel. However, this video is not sponsored by them and the testing is independent. This is the second gen of the D15, high level differences. Of course, I have the Chromax D15 here and the G2 it doesn't yet come in the black finish. It's on the horizon, not to mention the wait would not be very long. So hopefully that's coming soon. On the heatsink itself, you got a much bigger cold plate and uh, through that runs an additional two heat pipes. So now you have a total of eight. New is also the offering of three base plate flatness options that are tailored towards different CPUs. You have the standard or medium base convexity, an LBC or low base convexity, and a high base convexity. And the convexity of each option is designed and intended to provide optimal contact with whichever CPU you are choosing. And I'll discuss this choice later. Another thing I noticed when installing is that the G2 heatsink, it overhangs the bottom of the motherboard less. So we've got the base plates aligned about their centers. And you'll see the original D15, this is not the S, it actually sits a little bit lower. It is an asymmetrical heatsink with more in material intended to be on the top here. That will be more apparent when considering offset mounting for AM5 CPUs since in that installation you would actually lower the cooler about seven millimeters, which otherwise would result in very tight GPU to cooler spacing. Now in some fringe scenarios, the old D15, it would obstruct the first slot. When you mount with the Noctua logo on the left, at least that's how it's intended to be, your bottom section of the heatsink, there'll be a less overhang here. The mounting system is revised. G2 has what they call the Secu Firm 2 Plus mounting system, which uses an included torque screwdriver to drive the T20 mounting screws. In addition, the Intel mounts also use the T20 screws now. The new heatsink actually sits a little bit taller than the old heatsink, but with the old heatsink, the constraint was uh, definitely the fan on the RAM side. And this one had a tendency to push up well above the heat pipes and many times I've installed it. So 165 is the measurement on the heatsink. Uh, with the fan, I think that's where the extra three millimeters comes into play. Just potentially you could be, uh, not everyone's gonna use that kind of low profile RAM. So I think that's spec to account for the extra height from the fan protruding upwards. Finally, the new A14 by 25 r G2 fans. This is not the square frame version yet, but this is an improved fan design that Nocto has meticulously refined. A super low tip clearance of 0.7 millimeters. You got nine blades. They're back swept with a little bit of an angled kink here, this section here. This fan improves upon the acoustics and the performance. The new D15 G2 is the sum of the fan and heatsink improvements. And for mounting options, you got AM4, AM5, LGA 11.5X, LGA 1200, and LGA 1700. For the cross-brand cooler testing, I installed this on the ASUS X670E ITX in the Ghost R1. This is the board, which this board is not the worst offender, but the large bottom M.2 heatsink, it makes this not a very air cooler friendly board. But in fact, no issues here, even with that seven millimeter offset, and they've done really well with the adjustments here to the heatsink shape. AM5 uses a north-south mounting bar system in the AMB 14A, and I did the test, all the tests with the offset. I think as long as there isn't a physical obstruction, AM5 users should always be offset mounting and use the minus seven millimeter setting for the enhanced performance. This cooler is specced at 168 millimeters, but I measured the tips 
to the base plate to be 165 on this one. But the true clearance you need is actually dependent on your RAM interference. So on some boards, this may not be an issue. On ITX boards, most likely it will. Interestingly, on the Intel board that I tested, it wasn't because it was close enough uh, to the socket that actually the fan uh, passed the RAM. With the 35 millimeter tall RAM kit I was using, the side panel of the Ghost R1 made contact when I set it up with the AM5 setup here. There was a slight gap. It's not terrible, for, but for absolute compatibility in a scenario like mine, 168 millimeters of clearance would be safer. The case, of course, the Ghost R1 is spec for 165 millimeters, so not perfect there. For all testing, the coolers were set up as rear exhausting airflow with the fans pushing air through each heatsink section. Companion coolers I used for testing consisted of the highest performing large dual towers across a wide uh, variety of pricing. The $35 Thermalrite Peerless Assassin 120, which uses two 120 millimeter fans. The $100 Be Quiet Dark Rock Elite, which has two 135 millimeter fans. And the most recently $110 OG D15 or 120 in Chromax, but this was also offset mount. One thing to note, not all the tested coolers fit well with this case. Uh, only the PA120 offered a completely interference-free fit, as it should with its much lower height, but the G2 was actually the second best. The D15 Gen 1's old fans were more sensitive to cabling of the RAM, and you can see here that the old A14 fans actually protrude out a little bit more in the corners than this one. So this one was a little bit more sensitive. And the Dark Rock Elite pushed the panel out a lot, and that cooler is definitely not one that works for this case. For the testing, I used a 7900X that was clocked at 5.3 gigahertz and 1.2 volts, 146 watts of package power. It's lower than I test liquid coolers at, but with locked clocks, I do need to make sure that all the coolers can pass the tests without crashing, even when I use a lower fan level for some of the testing. All coolers were tested at two noise equal fan levels, but on one occasion, the PA120 was pretty much already maxed out and could not match the higher noise levels that the other coolers could. So at a moderate high noise level, all these coolers perform very well, and the difference is not large. The D15 G2 does, in fact, win out here. Uh, compared to the D15 G1, it is about a two and a half degree gap here. It's worth noting, that the PA120, which is within two degrees of the D15 G2, is only $35, like I mentioned. Um, at the high noise level, pretty much max for all these except the D15 G1, same hierarchy here. The gap does widen to about three degrees versus the G1. Closest is the Dark Rock Elite at about two degrees. So it's very impressive. The D15 G2 does take the cake here. The gap between the D15 G2 and Gen 1 is two to three degrees, and you might be wondering, you know, if it's new heat sink or if it's the fans. So if you use the new A14 G2 fans on the old Gen 1 heat sink, basically a fan upgrade, you can actually get most of the improvement of the Gen 2. The upgraded heat sink also provides a similar two to two and a half degree benefit. It's not linearly additive, of course, because you do have to consider the way the new fans interact with the new heat sink. And as far as I know, they're not just selling only the new heat sink. So only upgrading the fans is a possibility with the old one. If you have the new heat sink, interestingly, the new fans only provide a small added benefit. And I tested this phenomenon on the Intel side as well, and it completely held up. Of course, you're probably not gonna have the new heat sink and slap on the old fans. But one thing you can't really quantify here is I tested at the noise equal levels and the decibel meter cannot show the perceived noise due to the frequencies that human ears may find annoying. So let's do this. Here are three uh, plus three dBA sound samples from D15 G2, the PA120 and D15 Gen 1. And I won't tell you which one they are yet. Go ahead, take a listen and see if you have a preference on what you think. All right, A was the PA120, B was the D15G1, and C was the D15G2. To my ears, the G2 has a less offensive buzz or hum towards the high end, which the others, especially the old A14 fans have. For completeness, here is the sound profile of the D15G2 at 10% increments above 60% PWM, which is when you start being able to hear the noise from the cooler.
For Intel LGA 1700, two SKUs that you may want to consider are the HPC SKU and the standard one. And my testing for LGA 1700 was mainly for this purpose here, as well as comparing use with the included shims. Uh, but the testing will also give you an idea of the performance. So I went ahead and set up on the MSI Z690 ITX board with the 12700K. This is actually one of my favorite mini ITX boards of all time. Also fit very well. In fact, uh, with the way the RAM was positioned here, this fan can sit lower than the tips. So this is a completely perfect fit here. You also have a low M.2 heatsink, which never really gives air coolers issues anyway. So one thing with LGA 1700 ILM, which is the retention bracket, is that they apply a lot of uneven pressure to the rectangular CPUs, which results in warping. And specifically, the middle will tend to bow inward, and it leads to less than optimal contact with coolers, especially if you think it's curving and then you got a flat plate, right? So that's why you may have heard of things like the washer mod or things like contact frames, which attempt to circumvent the issue by evening out or lessening the pressure on the IHS. The HPC version attempts to match up to the shape of that potentially warped or warping CPU by using a higher convexity base plate. In addition, the G2 comes with a shim kit consisting of four spacers, and that's intended to go under the retention bracket component. So this is basically the washer mod, which reduces the ILM pressure to reduce some warping. So to install, you just unlatch the CPU while keeping it in place because the CPU will protect the pins underneath. You just unscrew the ILM mechanism, which I think the ILM bolts being T20 probably factored into Noctua's decision to go with T20. Either way, it's very convenient. You just place these spacers under the bracket and then reattach the whole assembly. It's not a very risky mod, but it's still a mod, and Noctua does disclaim any damage from you doing this mod. This would also technically void your CPU's warranty. I'm not sure how Intel would know that though, but you know, this is completely optional. For the install, Intel uses a modular backplate which can shift between LG 11.5X slash 1200 to LG 1700 simply based on where you put the standoff pin and then your spacers and mounting hardware sit over that. I am testing here with the CPU at about 218 watts package power. First off, without the spacer mod, the HPC version is slightly better than the standard version. So very good temps at any rate. After doing the spacer mod, things actually change and the standard version does leapfrog the HPC version. In fact, the HPC version performs more or less the same, actually, if you're technically looking at this number, it's slightly worse than the non-modded one. So it's worth noting that the 12700K I am using had been mounted for a few months, but then it was removed and sat in the box. So while it's not fresh, it hasn't been used extensively either. The board, it's also a relatively strong one. The Unify ITX board has a backplate and a relatively thick PCB, and the board is unlikely to significantly contribute to CPU warping uh, by bending itself. The gist is that the HPC version attempts to correct for a concave CPU. So the worse your CPU is warped, the more benefit you're gonna see from the HPC version. If you've already corrected for it by doing the shim or a washer mod, or you've placed a contact frame on it, you no longer have a highly concave CPU and the higher convexity of the HPC version will actually be counterintuitive, uh, whereas the medium convexity of the standard version will actually work great because you're now uh, perhaps a medium concave CPU. Uh, so if you don't want to mod, or you are mounting on a two-year-old CPU that's, you know, you think is pretty much bent out of shape, the HPC version is going to give you the highest performance. If you have a contact frame or you plan on doing the washer mod, the standard version will get you the best performance. So whatever you do though, if you are mounting for Intel, definitely don't get the LBC version and vice versa, don't get the HPC version for AMD. So we've talked about LGA 1700 specifically, and outside of that, you might wonder, well, which version should I get? So the LBC version is for very flat CPUs. AM4 and AM5 do fall under that category, as do lapped CPUs. AM4 doesn't benefit from offset mounting. However, AM5 does benefit from offset mounting. And Noctua's recommendation for offset mount AM5 is the standard version, which performs better than the uh, LBC version in this scenario. I didn't plan on testing on AM4, so I didn't request the LBC version for testing, although that may be something I experiment uh, with in the, in the near future. Either way though, my recommendation is that the majority of users should just go ahead and get the standard version. And here's my reasoning. While the LBC and HPC versions can provide superior performance on AM4 and LGA 1700, 
uh, respectively. Both of those sockets are on their last leg. So while you may get the best performance now, it wouldn't be ideal to have to buy another D15 G2 uh, when you upgrade your CPU. So air cooler like this, it's gonna go from CPU to CPU uh, to CPU. So if you go to either end of the spectrum, you're gonna restrict your future CPU choices. Whereas the all-rounder nature of the standard version will work very well regardless. In fact, it'll be really great right now. Anyway, for offset AM5 and shimmed LGA 1700, which will cover the majority of users getting the cooler now. So I've shown you the superior performance and the improved acoustics, but all this comes at a heavy cost. The D15G2 comes in at $150 US, and this is a, perhaps an unprecedented level for an air cooler. Uh, as mentioned, the D15 Gen 1 was $110, which was already a lot. Uh, many will lament this price increase, and to a large extent, it does come from the upgraded fans. These guys are $40 each versus the old A14s, which were roughly $25 each. So just that face value, that's $30 of your $40 price increase here. So these are pricey fans, but not entirely out of scale when you consider that the A12 by 25, they're going for $30, $31 right now. Versus the competition, for example, the Dark Rock Elite as tested is $50 less and a degree or two behind, and the PA120 is one fifteen dollars less than the G2 and only a touch behind the Dark Rock Elite. So against that backdrop, the D15 G2 is very difficult to justify unless utmost performance and acoustics are your priority. So if you're just looking for a cooler that gets the job done, the Thermalright PA120 is an amazing value. However, if you are someone who cares about every last drop of dependable performance, and quite frankly, if you watch this far, then you probably care mo more than most people, then I don't think this would be the worst way to spend your computing dollars. And it's a hobby after all for you. You're really getting some special tech, especially with these fans. And, and this stuff will last from CPU to CPU to CPU. And I expect this to well exceed Noctua's six year warranty. Um, so where I, might be most torn is actually if I had a D15 already because it, it already fits in your setup. And from the testing, you can get the majority of the thermal benefit and the acoustic benefits just by upgrading the fans on your D15. That's $80, right? Plus you get to keep your old fans as backups. So do you go ahead and get the whole new cooler or you just upgrade the fans, right? That, that That's the uh, kind of uh, thought process there. But one thing, and I know it sounds funny, but if I were in that position, I would see if you could find someone that's willing to buy your new heatsink if you get the, the whole uh, shebang. And perhaps your A14 fans, right? And and see if you can come in at lower than $80 for your two fans, just a thought. But yeah, if you want the best, this is the cost. So these fans, they really are so neat though. And I just can't wait to test these out even more. I hope you enjoyed this review and found it helpful. I'll be sure to test out the new square frame version when they come out. I kind of want to slap these on my 280 and see how they work. Actually, I'm definitely going to do that. So make sure you are subscribed to get all the updates on the new content. Please give a like. Links for the coolers and components are down below. Big thanks for watching.